Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the fourth of our Education, Humanities and Social Science um, webinar series. And um, this week I'm very pleased to say that we have Dr. Oslam Erdem and Imogen Fell who are from the Centre for Research into the Education of Marginalised Children and Young Adults. Oslam is going to be talking about local organisations, support mechanism for educating refugees, and Imogen will be talking about sexual exploitation in the Philippines, evidence of informed NGO response. Um, now, Imogen and um, Oslam both work um, in, in Kremsia, as it's called, which is headed by um, Dr. Kathleen Fincham and they run um, a newly validated uh, degree, an MA degree called Education, International Development and Social Justice. And if you'd like to find out more information about this master's, um, you can do so on the St. Mary's website. So our first speaker, Dr. Oslam Erdem, is a postdoctoral researcher. Um, she completed her PhD in curriculum studies at Indiana University, Bloomington, USA, uh, with the sponsorship of a Fulbright uh, foreign student program. So before coming to St. Mary's, um, Dr. Erdem worked as an adjunct lecturer at Middle East Technical University and Ankara um, Yildirim, Yildirim Bevisit University. She worked as an academic specialist and inquiry project coordinator at Indiana University Blooming Bloomington. Dr. Erden's scholarship examines issues such as youth's identity development, schooling experiences of refugee and immigrant children, livelihood approaches, citizenship education, and civic part participation, alternative education programs, and educational inequalities. So I'm going to hand you over now to Dr. Oslam Erden. Um, so please go ahead. Thank you very much, Kim, for introducing me. So um, I will start sharing my screen so therefore people can see my presentation. Okay, here we go. So my uh, presentation has the title Local Organization Support Mechanism for Educating Refugees. So before I start, I would like to um, thank my um, assistant uh, Fatima to Zehra Toprak. Uh, she was my former student, former master's student in the Migration Policies and Research Center at Ankara Yildirim, Be Yildirim Beyazıt University. So she was ha helping me to reach the participants and the contacts here, and also we are going to work on publications together. So I would like to provide some backgrounds about why we started this organizations, uh, why we started getting interested in these organizations. As you know, Turkey. Uh, began accommodating refugees from uh, countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, and Syria, obviously. And even though the government had different support mechanisms, it wasn't enough due to some of the erroneous assumptions made by the government. So therefore, local organizations started to fill, start emerge in the field to fill this gap. And we can also like, you know, look at these reasons in this summary. So first we can say that these local organizations be, uh, emerge because of the governance assumptions that Syrians will be staying in Turkey for a short while, but it didn't happen that way. They came in 2011 and still we are, the Turkey is hosting um, many Syrian refugees along with the Afghans, Uzbeks, Uyghurs and many other ethnic groups. And also Turkish co communities have a different perceptions about international organizations. Interestingly, the literature uh, mentioned, mentioned that uh, local com Turkish communities are not trusting international organizations and the values that they're bringing to the field. So therefore they want to have their own initiations. And also they have a political reactions to their existence and some of the political existence in Turkey were also the drivers for them to establish their own organizations. I mentioned these organizations as informal organizations because they don't have government recognitions. And also there's a belief that these are the most sustainable and acceptable uh, strategies to create cultural connections. 
So given this background, we just wanted to look at how do these local organizations function and help refugees? What are the discourses they use to regulate their aid activities? And how do they provide educational support to refugees based on their organizational structure and discourses? So it is interesting to see that they have a different definition of education. So therefore we use it as a kind of an operational definition to lead this research. According to the participants, the education is an enlightenment experience which enables individuals to empower themselves and others to raise consciousness and awareness towards the issues around them and also others with spiritual and ethic guideline based on their understanding of growth, development and recovery. So it is a combination of informal and non-formal education structures. When we look at the literature, we see the greater importance of such local and informal organizations because they can act as a mediator to build cultural connections and they can also help refugees to build the, a sense of belongingness. So therefore, like, you know, refugees can uh, improve the quality of their lives while they are learning ways to adopt their new social settings. And also they can learn necessary cultural and social skills from their local, um, local supporters. And this is also important to see that there are some examples of these support organizations in Albania and Lord Jordan, Lebanon, and all these networks are using their anthropological and historical backgrounds to find some discourses to regulate their activities. In Turkey, these activities have different, two different ways. So if it is official or done by, run by government, so it has a soft power policy, meaning that they do not only focus on the religious groups, they also uh, target some of the non-Muslim countries like Ethiopia, Tanzania. But informal organizations do not have share the same motivation with the government. So they want, um, uh, they want people to focus on the brotherhood, sisterhood policies, and then they want to, uh, they, yet they do not discriminate the others because of their religious beliefs, but if they need to prioritize the need of people, they first give the priority to the Muslim community. So for this research, there were some um, um, tips that was helping us to develop a theoretical framework. It wasn't only theory-driven theory research, but it also had some philosophical understanding. So therefore we combined social solidarity theory for, by uh, Emil Durkheim and the philosophy of responsibility to other and struggle with other by Levinas. So according to the social solidarity, we are talking about uh, two types of organizations. One is mechanical solidarity and the organic solidarity. The mechanical solidarity, when we talk about them, we are focusing on single ideas or uh, same beliefs, same duties. They follow the same creeds. And if the members do not obey these rules and functionalities, they need to be cast away from the community. Well, when it comes to the organic solidarity, the members of the community, they need to have specific and individualized roles. So what we observed in these groups, they have a different combination of these, these two solidarities, which I will be explaining later. And there is also the sense of um, dual effect, meaning that they want to help the people, but they also want to help to each other. Malki explained it really, uh, really beautifully with a term called need to help. So these organizations are also having their background such stories with their need to help. So if we tie, it up, tie this up with the philosophy developed by Levinas, so they have a greater responsibility to other. They feel obliged to do it and they do it compassionately. But whenever they interact with these groups, they also have a sense of reaction towards these groups because the other is the face of themselves as well. So in that sense, 
they are constantly having inner struggles and also finding some ways that may distort their social solidarity and constantly this this gets into the um, organizations, their organizations and the discourse development mechanisms. This is how we just set up the background of this study. So this study itself is a qualitative multiple case study. I do not want you to mix it up with the qual qualitative comparative analysis. We didn't do uh, such kind of analysis. What we did, we just, you know, what do constitute each of these organizations and their role as cases and chose five cases, meaning that five organizations and interviewed their members. So these five or in these uh, these interviews are done in focus groups and when necessary we inter interview individuals alone. We also had observations during the field and after the event during the field and when they are getting ready for the field. So they also have some of them, not all of them, have social media accounts and WhatsApp groups. So uh, I was a member of their social media groups and also some uh, part of some of the WhatsApp groups that they uh, that they est established to communicate with each other and also the members or the followers with, of themselves. So here I want to uh, thank you to the summary of the groups that we interviewed. So we had five groups in Ankara and Kayseri. So the um, three groups were located in Ankara and two groups were located in Kayseri. So when we look at the scale of these organizations, we have a variety uh, small scale groups, medium scale groups, and large scale groups. So the aims, if we just you know look at if you look at it from A, B, C, D, E, uh, the first group focus on orphans and disabled children and single mothers. They want to protect them from the male. Uh, they want to protect them based on their experiences or the problems that may enroot it in the society itself. And the second group provides humanitarian assistance. This is how they just, you know, um, define themselves. And they not only provide assistance in Turkey, they also provide these assistance across the border in Syria. The third group is a female-led group, and they provide mostly food, clothing, and household items as household items as a help. And they want to raise awareness for the need uh, for the need for help. And the third, fourth group solely focus on empowering women and school attendance of Syrian child refugees. And the fifth group is focusing on providing education, but when we say education here, it's mostly religious education, madrasa style education. And they also have a different interest here. They want to find jobs to male members of the refugee households. They think that it's a way of developing their structure. So here, I summarize the participants demographics. Uh, these are the important details that will help us to uh, that help us to define the uh, outcomes of uh, of this project. So we had five male, uh, eight female gr groups, uh, female members, and they had different income levels. But not uh, but these income levels are just you know varied in a way that it wasn't really influential in terms of running their organization because it was these organizations were not really money dependent and their age range so there were older members and also the younger members but it showed that all of these people had a background story to initiate the groups that they established so the leaders were particularly when they defined the aims they had their background, they use their background story to um, form their group, social groups. So here, uh, I can continue with the findings, but before showing the findings, I also want to show you the code map. So this is the detailed code map that we just um, produced after communicating with the um, so, uh, social support groups in Turkey. 
So we realized that these groups can be fun can function like uh, in three ways. They can be closed groups, semi-closed groups, or open groups. If you're talking about some closed groups like group E, D, and E, it doesn't matter that you want to volunteer in their activities. You need to have a reference from a member and you need to have a well-established trust before involving in these activities. And um, semi-closed groups, they accept volunteers, but they first want to test the endurance of these people before for the field work and also for being a role model to the refugee community in terms of raising their awareness to the oppression around them. And the group, um, a and B, they accept volunteers without any requirement, they, but when they get in the group, they want everyone to follow the same rules. If they don't do it, then they don't call them back. Then that's the simple way, the simplest explanation of taking them out their group. So here we can talk about the aims of these organizations. So they want to reach the marginalized, empower the woman, provide a moral or religious education, and want to develop the society in some ways. So in that sense, they are building some kind of metaphorical understanding, but they're also using the patriarchal norms to um, set up these principles. For example, I mentioned about the group E, which is the one of the close group in Kayseri aiming to fi find jobs to be male household members. So this idea is getting driven by their religious understanding actually because they want the woman and uh, to take care of the children's education, mostly religious education, but then men to provide a sustainable life to their family so therefore they won't be dependent on this family. Well, when it comes to like, you know, other uh, organizations like the group A, so they are focusing on this, you know, bridging marginalized option. So they notice that um, the orphans and disabled uh, members of the refugee community, they are least rich and least known. So because they can't go to the official centers, that's why they are focusing on these groups. So, and they had some, the leader had some experiences with these groups. So therefore she, he decided to go with these kind of aims. And when it comes to the third team, we just you know, explained the rules of the organization, which is transparency, meaning that they need to do everything open. But as I need to highlight that there are close, semi-close and the open groups. Semi-close and open groups use social media. So therefore they can post their, post everything online. They can also provide um, some video records, field notes, and so many other types of information to the people. They, uh, but for the closed groups, this is happening between their WhatsApp groups. So if you're a member of their WhatsApp group, you can receive information about it. But whatever they do, they need to be so transparent to the other members of the community. And they have a strict money policy. They do not accept cash. It is very interesting in terms of thinking that all, most of the aid activities are dependent on money. But they say that if they say people, if they want to help, they need to give money to the refugee community directly. So which uh, it this, this also requires a compulsory service. Any person who wants to donate or who wants to be a member, they need to be in the field that these groups established or ter created a territory in their region. So therefore anything should be done through that way. So there is also Zekat and Fitre understanding. This is money involved activities and you can't necessarily de-associate them from the mo direct money involvement. So as I mentioned here, they do not accept them as cash as well. If people have Zekat, so they Zekat, meaning that they need to give the for the person uh, one, uh, they need to divide their income into 40 and give the one point of it to the poor. So this is the rule they still need to do it in person. 
So when they have red flagging issues, meaning that uh, someone is misusing the community, so they do all sorts of activities to remove them from the group. Even public shunning is an example of what they can do if the people goes really extreme in terms of abusing the system. And the fourth tip, theme is explaining the discourses. As you recall, this is the second research question that we were looking at. So we just realized that religion, conscious responsibility and empathy came out as the biggest uh, discourses that they use. Everyone talk about religious duty, but, interest but interestingly, some of the groups did not associate it with the rules in Quran. So they associated it with the consciousness, feeling, being empathetic. And here there was a kind of a gender differences in terms of who uses which type of empathetic structures. So the female members or female led groups are more inclined to use their consciousness and empathy to connect with the, or uh, with their people, with the people that they're helping, but the male members are using the responsibility and religion more often than the female mem female led groups, because they think it's a kind of a masculine uh, positionality that need that they need to take the lead. And finally, as I mentioned in the beginning, they had a very broad understanding of education. So it is spiritual, it should include awareness raising, it should include cultural teaching and so forth. But when you ask them directly, even the group, um, the group um, B, D, which takes uh, children directly to school to register them and follow, uh, monitor their school attendance, they tell that they do not call themselves as a group helping, refuge, helping refugees to get education. So, because for them, if they are not teaching something directly, they cannot claim this role in the society. So it is like a you know, teacher role. So they only have an understanding that education should happen in schools. But when we look at them, they have a tutorship system, they have material support, they, have, they monitor attendance and progress, school, progress in school. And they do raise consciousness raising and awareness increase and in the society. So here, when we look at it, um, people just you know try with the tutorship system. They try their they help their homework. They teach mothers about the school uh, school and the system, and they also try to teach Turkish language to help them to um, increase their adaptation to their new, new, new situation. For the school projects, they just bought, uh, for the material supports, they bought bags, stationery, school supplies, clothes for school, and make sure that they have um, food for, uh, they have enough food for the children to eat. In. But some of these groups, particularly male-led group, male groups, they also get involved recently. It wasn't, it didn't happen when we started this project in December, but after in March, they started building schools in Turkey and also uh, in Syria. Sorry, my time is up, but I will have like, you know, a couple sec, a couple minutes to wrap this up. So, um, as I mentioned, like they have, they, they started building schools, particularly group A, they had sister organizations um, to, to establish connections to build schools in Idlib. So that's one of the things they, that they now started claiming specific roles in terms of educating refugees. Sometimes you can see female groups acting as ad hoc caregivers. When I said that they register students to the school, they literally take refugee students to school as their family members and then register them to school. But that, they, that's like the, you know, the, the thing that they don't consider as helping refugees. So going back to my original slides, I think I, I can show you some pictures just, to, just as an example. For example, here, you can see how uh, the first picture is one of the overseas activities that, they, that one of the group had with an official organization in Tanzania. The second picture is one of the uh, 
or, um, sister organization collaboration with Group C in terms of uh, delivering food to the people who are in need during the COVID-19 situation. And this is an iftar preparation, the third one. And you can see that here in this picture, there are different types of things. And they use social media to give messages about their understanding. Like, for example, they use Hazreti Ali. It's one of the caliphs in Islam to uh, to share the share important message about humanitarian acts. And also, you can see there are some kind of group activities that they use to um, to help refugees to enjoy some different types of things. So they do not want only want refugees to get food. They also want to see different social venues in Turkey. And finally, these are the uh, pictures from the educational activities they, they see. Sorry for um, this uh, text. I didn't want to uh, translate it, but this, the one in, written in Turkish, it just has an announcement about the school opening in Idlib for uh, orphan children. And there is also a national day celebration, school supply, uh, support and COVID-19 education and also the personal tutorship um, uh, process picture. So finally I can say that these groups are functioning as a half mechanical, half organic solidarity because they know the capacity of themselves. They want to function everything as a mechanical society when it comes to dealing with their own um, structural situation but when they want to open their st structure to the other people they en enlarge this to an organic solidarity they all reject the uh, political organizations and try to exclude all political affiliations and this rule is among the many rules that they have to ensure their sustainability and functionality transport trustworthiness in humanitarian field and we see that this gender role is a determining factor, but the frequency of responses in relation to the changes in their empathy level, shopping behavior and living styles and sleep pattern shows that gender composition effect affects the characteristics of these organizations. And finally to say, these organizations are the result of eclectic composition of empathy, responsibility, religion, and consciousness discourse, which happens to be the driver of the refugee education activities also. These activities are built mostly on material support, but it is observed that the members of these organizations feel responsible to educate the refugees and locals to develop a form of self-awareness, spiritual growth, and cultural understanding due to their mediatory position between these two communities. And so I will stop uh, sharing my, I don't know how to stop sharing right now, sorry. Um, just a second. If you go to the top, um, Oslam, and it'll just okay. say Something something happened with the, uh, I don't know, I just can't get, get back to my share sharing point did you take me out maybe try to okay okay let's see i see the panelist list okay that's okay. great now uh -huh. I see that. <laughs> Very nice. so for everything so this is what i want to say about this if there are questions i will be happy to answer them Okay, thank you very much, Oslam. Um, we've got, there is um, a Q&A um, function at the bottom of the um, Zoom window. So um, if you are um, an attendee, please feel free to use that button and to ask any open questions, um, which we will come to at the end of Imogen's talk. So um, I want to move on now to um, introduce Imogen Fell, who is going to be delivering her paper um, sexual exploitation in the Philippines, evidence of informed NGO response. And um, Imogen is a PhD student from the Center for the Study of Modern Slavery at St. Mary's University. Um, she obtained her MA in social work at the University of Salford, and she was a visiting researcher at the Social Development Research Center at De La Salle University in the Philippines. So I'm going to pass you over to Imogen, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some questions. Thank you. 
I think she just lost connection, so she will probably rejoin in a bit. She's lost a connect. Okay, fine. All right. Um, we've got a cue. We've got a question here. In fact, to Oslam. Um, but there's that. I think Muniat, did you want to ask a question? Just put it in there, and we can answer that for you. Um, just while we're waiting for Imogen to come on. Um, the, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that are held um, to promote the research activity of the staff and postgraduate students, as well as external speakers um, in the subjects of education, humanities and social sciences. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, the Centre for the Research into the Education of Marginalised Children and Young Adults um, is headed up by Dr Kathleen Fincham, who runs the MA in Education, International Development and Social Justice. Um, Imogen works in the Centre for the Study um, into Modern Slavery, um, and that's, that research centre also um, runs a very successful MA in Human Trafficking which you can find out about on our external website. Um, just to say as well that Kremsia, the uh, Research Centre into Marginalised Children and Young Adults, will be holding um, a symposium on Thursday the 18th of June and Friday the 19th of June. Um, details of that can be found um, on the external St Mary's website and on StaffNet, um, the title of which is Young Lives at the Margins. So um, I would recommend that. Um, do we have Imogen back yet? Yeah, I'm back. Oh, you're back, lovely Imogen. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to stop talking and pass over to you then. Okay. Well, um, I'll just share my screen and then um, thank you very much, Kim. And thank you, Oslem. It was great to hear about your work. I'm just going to share my screen. So yeah, good morning everyone um, and thank you as well for, for attending. It's great to have you all here. Um, I'm going to be talking um, about sexual exploitation in the Philippines, looking at evidence for informed NGO responses. So um, predominantly most of the, the studies are led by NGOs um, and uh, these are predominantly led by UNICEF, Plan International, International Justice Mission. These are the large international organizations that lead a lot of responses towards uh, online child sexual exploitation and sexual exploitation. There's also a lot of gray, gray literature, which has been really vital towards knowledge development, which really signals pivotal historical and political events as being causal um, to some extent to the issue of, of child sexual exploitation, sex tourism, and um, the more topical role of technology in uh, sexual crimes against children. I think for the most part, um, child sexual exploitation is a, a hugely contentious issue uh, in the Philippines where child rights advocates, international and local agencies recognize that there are grave, um, grave, grave uh, human rights abuses um, that are going on and have um, moved the spotlight away from child sexual exploitation um, and as well as communities are, are rapidly becoming more uh, transnational the international dynamic of sexual exploitation and the awareness of the social problem has become uh, increasingly more complex so just to give an overview um, of what I intend to uh, demonstrate today during our webinar um, I intend to give an overview really of, of CSE uh, child sexual exploitation in the Philippines, providing some contextual understanding to the issue. I can't, I don't really want to delve into it too much just because, um, you know, that's not necessarily a specific area that I want to, to focus on directly around those issues. So I'm going to try and just give some contextual understanding. Um, and also then to explore uh, the evidences uh, towards NGO responses really, um, and how, how these are informed and what these look like. So just to, just to focus really on, on uh, child sexual exploitation, 
Um, so the, really the leading narrative for uh, sexual exploitation in the Philippines at the moment has been a focus on online sexual exploitation and child pornography. Um, and this has been really uh, a drive, I think, from the focus being on uh, international community looking at um, addressing demand and issues around, um, you know, the international element of, of, of sexual exploitation evolving. Um, what we've seen is that, I mean, in 2017, UNICEF stated that the Philippines is the, has the fourth highest number of prostituted children uh, globally and is a hotspot really for the live stream sexual abuse trade um, with online sexual exploitation being the leading form of cybercrime in the Philippines making up half of, of the reported cases um, and the challenge here is that cases of online sexual exploitation are a result of cheap and easy or uh, one, one of the results of it is this, there's cheap and easy access to internet and money transfer services, which allow for international demand to be feasible and more accessible. Um, factors of CSE um, that have come out within literature are that um, poverty is seen to be one of the driving driving forces for, for children becoming victims of, of online um, child sexual abuse <coughs> and exploitation. Other driving forces include, you know, that as a, a post-colonial nation that there's a, a good grasp of the English language which allows for um, perpetrators and um, viewers of child pornography and, and, and uh, to uh, give instruction to, to families and children um, for cases of, of live stream sexual abuse. It's also, um, and also another factor is around affordable and widespread internet access. It's very easy for um, small communities to access the internet through, they, they're referred to as PisoNet um, online cafes where you pay a very, very small amount of money to access uh, internet services and engage in, in um, social media as a, as a form of, of grooming for, for young children. It's also, I think with, with online sexual exploitation, Perpetrators um, or facilitators of, of sexual exploitation tend to be um, parents, and so um, there's this perception around easy it being an, an avenue of easy money um, to support family and cultural norms around um, a very in Southeast Asia the the focus of collective uh, collective family mentality and cultural norms around that. Um, look to put the needs of the family above those of, of the individual and the child's welfare. And so this can be hugely problematic um, with regards to safeguarding children um, from risks that, um, that they may be uh, sexually exploited. I think in addition, I think from the data that I've collected from this study, um, consumerism among young people tends to be an area that's also been uh, a growing trend as, as globalization plays more of a role in terms of uh, the desires and wants of young people um, and access to, to goods and, and different um, clothes and, and cell phones. Um, this has also been a, a, a pull factor uh, for children to be drawn into to being uh, sexually abused. I think as well the environment and enabling factor has been the challenges around law implementation and prosecution which have kind of been in place to provide, that are in place and um, are limited in terms of providing them the ideal conditions for Filipino children to be sexually exploited. Um, just some of the frontline trends, I just want to, to skim over this just because this is, this is directly really from, from um, the data. Um, is that there's really a dominant tourism and agenda um, in the Philippines and long-standing history of, of prostitution um, in areas such as Cebu, which is one of the areas um, where the, re the data was gathered, um, has a very long history of um, fishing, fishing villages um, and traditional trades of, of that nature. And th these traditional trades are being replaced with hotels and bars and so um, employment in these areas are becoming trained employment um, 
it is, is a sought after thing um and these trades are, are resulting in children being lost to to um and at risk of being of sexually being sexually exploited there's really heavy dependency uh, as well on ngos there's a lack of um financial sustainability and thus pressures then to deliver to funding bodies as a re as a resource of as a, a way of resource alongside this we see that um the government cooperation is is um, somewhat limited um, as structures are very decentralized in local communities um, and there's less of a, a priority um, for there to be focus on on sexual exploitation with infrastructure um, and this idea and this capitalistic um, focus to look at uh, developing uh, more industries and uh, tourism industries being the, the focus really um, I think as well and I think there's just been a, an overall lack of, of critical research really to bolster evidence-based policymaking uh, within the area of, of sexual exploitation. So for this study, um, the data collection um, was over, was in three, uh, three areas um, and the evidence formed um, is formed from frontline practitioners based at, at grassroots NGOs. So these were based in uh, a longer po, which is the, the top circle um, in the northern part of Luzon, Manila, which is Metro Manila, this is the capital of, of the Philippines, and Cebu, um, which is highlighted at the bottom. Uh, and an ethnographic methodology um, was adopted using grounded theory. Um, as an approach to to draw out key themes from the data, um, I think the emphasis really I think what I what I want to really pull out from this um, and what I want to show I, I guess as part of the webinar is that is really the interviews kind of with more of the international NGOs and government agencies, but as well focus on what the grassroots role is and that actually uh, what is informing NGOs as a whole um, is a common theme and it's not just specific to, a, to grassroots organisations or international organisations, but it's a coherent, um, coherent thing across, across the board for NGOs. So um, in terms of the NGO context, just to give you some background, in the Philippines, um, yeah, the Philippines, Philippine Civil Society has the third largest NGO community in, in the developing world. And there's a real significant role for um, NGOs uh, to fill in the gap for limited go uh, government services that are currently in place. And really this is down to lack of resource and allocation, um, as I said previously. Uh, I think the focus really for, for the study was really to do, look at um, the three NGOs um, getting in depth to what actually the efforts are and the responses are and understanding really at the, at the core and the crux of the of the frontline uh, practitioners efforts what the challenges are um, and what uh, is being done because there's very minimal evidence to uh, articulate kind of what is actually going on at the front line what we see really is that uh, responses by NGOs are very uh, issues, are issue based. So they're targeting issues, um, and as a result, these are very symptomatic rather than actually addressing the core issues um, and challenges. Um, I guess the, the structural issues that are in place. Okay. Um, So I think a key characteristic, I think what I want to, to pull out of, of, of this is the, the focus of, on formalization of NGOs. And what we've seen here, um, what I've seen here in the Philippines is that um, a lot, the organizations are very formalized in how they conduct, um, how they conduct their responses towards um, child sexual exploitation. And these are due to the fact that they're predominantly funding driven um, a lot of international organizations provide a lot of funding in order for these organizations to be sustainable, to allow for the responses, um, to have the resources that they need to uh, respond to the challenges of uh, international demand. Um, and also, uh, it also formalized structures allow for uh, 
an audit and um, auditing and measuring effectiveness um, and transparency really for funding and funding criteria. So uh, local organizations or NGOs have become more formalized in terms of being more business structured, um, more centralized structures in order to ensure that they can meet criteria demands. We also see that actually um, in line with this, there's also the need to be more, more formalized, if you will, um, in order to respond to multi-agency responses. So for example, with online sexual exploitation, uh, the introduction of, of international uh, crime agencies, um, the Australian National Police, these organizations require a certain level of organization and, and formalization in order to meet um, the the processes and procedures and so NGOs local NGOs are, are becoming more formalized in order to meet those demands there's also a real drive to at uh, the front line to improve um, victim-centered responses so they recognize there's a real need for children to be off the street um, and that there needs to be more of a focus on initiating recovery and um, support for children and rescuing children uh, from, from, uh, from uh, being sexually abused and exploited. And so that, that has also been a key driver. And I think um, as well competition with other organizations, but like I said, it's, that's predominantly uh, a funding, funding driven thing to, towards organizations being more, more formalized. Um, I'm going to just briefly go over uh, some of the NGO responses um, for the three NGOs that I spent, uh, I did the ethnographic study with, just to give you an overview of some of the actual responses that are uh, in place. So the responses are issue-based are issue -based interventions to tackle uh, the prevailing problems that present for cases of online sexual exploitation, commercial sexual exploitation. So uh, the organisational structures um, consists predominantly of professional staff, uh, litigation, advocacy staff and social workers um, who support and develop cases to address uh, projects given by organisations who are funding, um, funding the NGOs to conduct, conduct these studies on the ground. Just an overview really and give you, giving you a profile of each NGO so that you can understand a little bit more um, context to these these titles that I've given under each NGO. Um, so NGO A is is a based in central Luzon, um, and they their projects uh, involved the rescue, the therapeutic interventions, and legal support of sexually abused and exploited children. So they house they house children um, and give shelter to children who have been rescued um, from cases of, of sexual exploitation. So they work collaboratively with um, the Department for Social Welfare and Development, which is uh, the social services for on the ground uh, Filipino efforts towards uh, protecting children and child welfare, um, along with the Filipino National Police and, and international agencies. Alongside this rescue operation, they're brought into, um, into shelters where they are um, alongside rehabilitation and, and therapeutic services, um, which involves um, a psychologist and dealing with the traumas and, and, and therapy, uh, the option of, of obtaining uh, justice and this criminal, criminal justice focus around prosecuting um, perpetrators who have um, exploited the child. So along, this is a, a parallel kind of uh, response by NGO A. Uh, their efforts and projects also involved um, a heavy focus on prevention work, so advocacy and educating in communities. So they go out into the local communities and deliver public education and prevention seminars, um, providing specialised integration workshops, um, training seminars with um, specific members of the team. Um, and these are carried out in schools, um, in local, local barangays, which are, are local councils that um, deliver frontline responses to um, small matters within communities that are not managed by the local government. Um, and 
and also in schools. So children who are under a certain age, um, there will be puppet shows to educate them on good touch, bad touch, um, and also around how to report um, exploitation and also key risk, risks that may lead them into potentially being sexually exploited. There's also um, youth organized, youth organized um, empowerment. So they do empowerment training for teenagers um, because, the av because the average age of, of uh, sexual exploitation, online sexual exploitation is 14, according to the existing data from the, the Philippine Statistic Statistics uh, Agency. Um, but this training provides um, them with some social interaction and, and embedding family values um, and leadership training and, and character formation through activities of, of theatre groups, uh, seminars and workshops and summer camps. And this is led by the youth um, and also is inclusive of the youth themselves. So it, it really gives them an, uh, an, uh, an agency and an empowerment um, to, to get involved with that. Um, there's quite a lot of, of different um, sections, but I think, I think one important thing to focus on is actually the real focus on protection and um, prosecution across the board. Um, all of the NGOs that I spent time with focus really on uh, protection in terms of rescue and rehabilitation and um, also the aspect of, of prosecution and looking to um, that criminal justice model, which, which um, is, has been a, a running theme, I think, through um, the responses for, for the NGOs that I was with. So I think what's important, and I think for the purposes of, of, the, of what I set out to do within the webinar, um, is to understand really how, how, NGO, uh, how NGO responses are informed. <clears throat> and I think because of the heavy dependency upon international funding um, and the lack of, of local resource, um, there's a real focus on seeking criteria internationally, uh, seeking funding internationally, which thus um, the criteria is coming from an inter from international um, bodies. So I think in scoping and, and, and data collection for the study, it was clear that the on-the-ground functions were guided by elements of a four-piece framework um, and model, which is the model for the trafficking in persons report, um, which looks at prevention, protection, prosecution, and, and partnership. Um, and these efforts really um, give a direction to how NGO responses in the Philippines should be um, and they and, and thus NGO responses are guided um, by the projects and criteria of, of this framework um, and essentially is utilized as a, as a fundamental guide um, and has been applied and adopted for the purposes of, of improving NGO systems and the practical on the ground um, responses and processes that can be um, that can be shaped to towards Im improving um, improving the situation of, of sexual exploitation. Um, and in actuality, um, the model is is strong in terms of it provides an international uniform paradigm to tackling the responses of, of CSE, which is a which acts as a fit for purpose model. It's a robust uh, framework. Um, which responds by applying a life cycle essentially um, and, in, and steps to, towards a, a coherent and strong response towards uh, addressing sexual exploitation. The, the challenges here with, with um, having an international formed, uh, informed responses um, driven by, by funding um, although important for the sustainability of, of local NGOs, the heavy, the heavy dependency upon this has um, numerous challenges, I think. What we see is that you know, NGOs are shaped by numerous stakeholders um, whose interests you know, seek to ensure the longevity and relevance of the organisation, but also to really tackle the issue of, of sexual exploitation, um, where uh, you know, there's, there's clearly uh, a real issue happening on the ground. 
we we see really that there's been more of an international focus with with um with the you know the four piece paradigm and, and the trafficking persons report um because uh what we've seen is that the philippines with like the u.s state department um have joined have joined in a joint commitment um and a child protection compact partnership to really address you know child protection efforts on the ground i think for ngos and their dependency on international funding has had huge implications uh in terms of their ability to kind of not to deviate from that there's very limited scope to explore other options um and that there's a risk that Filipino NGOs could be caught in a, in a kind of stagnant cycle of, of adhering to established funding guidelines based upon um, this paradigm as an accepted and you know, presumed model of effectiveness, rather than actually being able to have the scope to explore a more localized targeted model to address uh, child sexual exploitation. Uh, expectations really exist that progress will be made using this framework as the most effective response. And this may be the case, but the, the evidence um, behind the model um, has, has a minimal, has minim, has, is embedded with assumptions about how responses should be. I think from the data and from the themes from, uh, from the frontline practitioners, they've really indicated their, uh, their progress to try and implement more local localized expertise um, and to develop this further given the cultural and contextual differences to um, an overarching model and and therefore there's more potential effect uh, potential to be more effective um, with utilizing a more contextually focused model um, perhaps using the four piece as a backbone um, however, the lack of, of um, sufficient resources um, on the ground makes it really difficult to, to maintain those kinds of changes. Um, thank you. Uh, there, that's all I think I have time for, um, but I hope that that gives you some, some understanding and background to um, my topic. Thank you very much, Imogen. Um, are you able to stop sharing your screen? And um, we'll just move on to some questions. We've actually got um, four questions um, to ask. So um, the first one comes from um, Zen, who says, Imogen, you use organic and, oh, sorry, Oslam, you use organic and mechanical solids solidarity to understand your findings which I assume you took from Durkheim yes I think you did <laughs> I'm sorry I came a bit late have you also tried to analyze your work via Ibn Khaldun's concept of, as a buyer both organic and mechanical um, Ibn Khaldun thought outlined his this theory centuries before Durkheim so Oslam that's a question for you yeah actually um we haven't thought about using Ibn Khaldun's theory, uh, the concept of solidarity and Asabiya, because like, honestly, like, you know, we were much focusing on the literature available and what the other people use. But I think it will be a great suggestion because we use the combination of uh, uh, social solidarity and the Levinas philosophy to be able to uh, match the uh, ongoing activities in Turkey, but as Zin suggested, Ibn Khaldun's theory, uh, theory might be a great way to explain it because it also explains this kind of social dynamics from a philosophical perspective. So I'll, we will definitely consider this as a suggestion. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, then again, um, Im to Imogen this time, um, the president of the Philippines is a bit of a character, to put it lightly. What's your assessment of the impact of his presidency on CSE or on foreign aid? Uh, yeah, I think, I think um, that's a good question, actually. And it's very relevant, I think, to the, the prevailing situation, I think, in the Philippines. We've seen, I think, in the last two weeks, one of the major... The Philippines has very um, complex political... Uh, dynamics and I think we've seen in the last couple of weeks uh, the kind of deterioration of the of uh, 
structures with COVID going on. Um, but I think for, for CSE, there's, I think the real uh, challenge has been um, around the agenda on, on drugs. Um, the government's really pushing for uh, a drugs agenda, which essentially targets the very poor and vulnerable. Um, it's really hard not to be opinionated about these, these situations, but the evidence states that a lot of um, those are, are poor. So I can say that. Um, however, I think as well, this pulls away, I think it pulls away from other issues that are ongoing, such as, as child welfare and, and child protection. Um, and although they've implemented certain legislation around um, ensuring the protection of children, uh, the lack of implementation and the follow through essentially of, of legislation has made it really difficult and that really needs a government response which hasn't been the case because of the, the focus on more of a, a, of a, uh, a drugs agenda. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. I have to not say more. <laughs> Uh, just one final question then unfortunately we're going to have to close but um, um, so Muniatz who's one of our PGR students thank you for, for tuning in um, Austin did your findings answer all of your research questions yeah we just have uh, like obviously we will go back to the field to gather more information but as I showed in the data coding map we just, you know, associated all our fundings with the research questions. So we didn't have any problems in terms of uh, finding the connections between our research questions and the codings that's generated as a result of, you know, coding. And, uh, but however, um, to receive more satisfactory data, we need to interview more members. So therefore like, you know, that will be more solidified responses to our quest research questions when we just wrap up this research. Okay, thank you. And actually, we had just have one last question in, just very quickly, um, again to Oslam, from Mohamed Elenin, um, who's a volunteer at an after-school homework club for refugees and asylum seekers in Belfast, and he's going to be joining St Mary's next year for his PGCE. Um, what do you think is the major factor in helping refugees? Um, According to the result, uh, the major factor is consciousness. So the people are very empathetic and feel really restless about not helping refugees. So when they encounter refugees as others, they feel that they need to help them as part of their humanity. Because if they don't do it, they just, then after that, they feel ashamed when they're interacting with their family members. But then we can also consider this as as the result of their religious upbringing because the religion itself islam in that context is telling them to be aware of the others around them and helping their neighbors like mentioned in the christian doctrine and also uh, sharing their income to a certain degree with the rules called zakat and fitra in certain times so when you specifically ask these people what are their motivation they say they're conscious consciousness but if you dig it down with the discourses and all the other factors i will say that it it is the religious upbringing okay that's very interesting um both very um really insightful papers and also difficult papers i think and difficult research to kind of really immerse yourself in those kinds of subjects must be quite, um, you know, quite trying for you um, sometimes. But so we really, really appreciate what you're doing. And um, thank you for presenting today. Next week, we have um, um, our webinar is at one o'clock. And um, we have Dr. Steve Davis, who's the head of education in the Institute of Economic Affairs and Madeline Grant, who's the assistant comment editor on The Telegraph. Um, and they're going to be talking about cross-contamination, exploring disease in literary narratives and the historical links between disease and globalization. Um, but I just want to thank everyone for logging in today. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Emmanuel Cossack in the background who's directing all of this. So thank you all and have a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.